The show opens in September 2020 as a group of soldiers goes into position across a bridge while a helicopter flies above them. Multiple bodies move on the ground below them, but they can't see clearly because of the snowfall. After a while, the helicopter catches a glimpse of a man coming out of one of the destroyed buildings. The soldiers debate if the man is still human as he appears to be badly wounded. The corpses around the building no longer look like humans, and the majority of them have long, sharp fingers and charred skin. As the helicopter continues to fly around the area to provide air support, the soldiers plan on moving closer to get visual confirmation. However, before they can do so, someone cancels the order. Soon after, they open fire on the man approaching them. Despite getting hit multiple times, he doesn't go down and continues approaching the bridge. The scene shifts a month earlier when the world is a very different place. Lush greens consume the environment as crickets chirp in the distance. Our protagonist, Chahayun Su, arrives at an apartment complex named Green Home. He's living alone and a reserved person. However, things don't get off to a good start as he immediately argues with the security guard who is cutting the lawn. Following this, Cha goes to his apartment and sits down on the floor. After contemplating about committing suicide, he goes to the rooftop. There, he stands on the ledge and looks down on the highway below. Meanwhile, the guard is dozing off in his office when a resident of the apartment notices it and tells him to get rid of the bed. The two have a small argument whether security guards should be allowed to sleep on duty. Just as the resident leaves, a woman approaches the guard's office. The woman tells the guard she used to live in Gangnam and gives him a container full of fish for lunch. Later, as the guard opens up the container, his nose immediately starts bleeding and he clutches it with both hands. On the rooftop, just as Cha is about to jump, he hears a slapping sound behind him. He turns around and sees a beautiful woman, Li Yun Yu, practicing ballet. Everything is going great for the ballet dancer until she steps on a piece of gum. While trying to remove the gum off her shoes, she sees Cha and inquires about what he's doing. She eventually tells him not to commit a suicide, as it would cause a lot of problems for everyone else in the building. Fortunately, this convinces Che not to jump and he returns downstairs. However, the guard is waiting for him in front of his apartment. He apologizes for the accident earlier and gives Cha beer. Only after he accepts the beer, does the guard finally release the door of the apartment. Sensing something weird, Cha immediately throws the beer inside the trash bin once he is alone. He then returns to his door to check if the guard had left. However, when he looks through the peephole, the guard is still standing nearby. Just then, a woman who lives next door to Cha passes by, and the guard greets her. The woman is on the phone with her mother when she suddenly gets a nosebleed. Meanwhile, another tenant in the same apartment, Ji Su, sits in her room smoking. She is a talented guitarist and eventually heads out for work. With a bass guitar on her back, she waits for the elevator to arrive. Soon afterwards, she runs into another tenant, a rather crazy lady who wheels a pram with no baby inside. Jisoo soon learns from another man that this woman is suffering from grief of losing her baby. The man giving her this information is Jung Jae Hyun, a very religious Korean language teacher who also lives in the same apartment complex. A quick montage of scenes shows several other residents here, including a shady-looking Payon Sang Wook who smokes in his room while torturing someone on the floor. Wrapped up in tape, this man struggles to breathe as Wook stubs his cigarette out in the man's mouth. In the evening, Che stays in his room playing games while the girl next door is feeding her cat. Despite being on a diet and trying to lose weight, she can't help but complain that she's starving to death. She seems to be on the phone with her family, mentioning that she's been experiencing auditory hallucinations and unexplained nosebleeds lately. As she finishes the call, the sound of the girl breaking down and crying can be heard. Exhausted from playing games, Cha prepares to sleep. Suddenly, he receives a text message from a delivery man. With the security guard absent, the package has been left at his door. Strangely enough, the package seems to have been opened and the instant noodles inside have been scattered all over the floor. Following the trail of the noodle crumbs on the ground, Cha arrives at the apartment of his neighbor, whose front door is open. Suddenly, a bloody hand reaches out from inside the room and grabs the decapitated pet cat, the body of which has been eaten. Horrified, Cha dashes back to his room and hides under the covers. After a while, the doorbell rings and the girl next door speaks in a panicked tone pleading for help repeatedly. Cha musters up the courage to answer a video call on his security camera. The girl tearfully tells him that she just got home to find the door unlocked, her room in disarray, and her cat missing with blood all over the floor. She begs Cha to open the door and accompany her. Cautious, Cha doesn't immediately open the door and opts to help the girl by calling the police instead. But there's no cell signal. To rule out that the girl isn't the monster that ate the cat, Cha wants to see if there's blood on her hands. 
Unexpectedly, the girl's face turns pale and she becomes frantic. The next second, she roars at Cha to open the door, looking menacing and with blood streaming from her nose. Just as she's about to break in, music coming from upstairs distracts her and she leaves. Armed with a stick, Cha goes outside to investigate and sees Wook coming downstairs. Cha asks him if he has seen a strange woman but faints before Wook can answer. Meanwhile, Jisoo is immersed in her music, unaware of what's happening outside. Hearing the doorbell, she thinks she has disturbed the neighbors with her late-night music and hurries to apologize. But as she looks up, she sees a girl's terrifying, monstrous face. It is Che's neighbor and she keeps repeating she's hungry. When Jai Su refuses to open the door, she becomes desperate and starts pounding on the door. Scared, Jai Su grabs a baseball bat for defense. However, when she returns to the door, the monster girl has disappeared only to be replaced by the sudden appearance of Wook which startles her. Next, Ji Su tells Wook about her horrifying encounter. They notice a large hole in the glass window at the end of the hallway, which likely was the escape route of the monster girl. Wook then takes a swing at her door leaving an indentation, which is a testament to his incredible strength. In the evening, Lee Yoon Hayuk, the ballet girl's brother, prepares to go out for work. Unfortunately, he discovers that the elevator is not functioning properly and walks down to the ground floor. At the same time, other tenants of the apartment building who want to go out find that their phones have lost signal. To make matters worse, all the exits of the apartment building have been locked. It seems that someone is deliberately trying to trap everyone inside the building. Sai Young, a former Special Forces soldier who now works at the fire department, violently breaks the lock on the control room door and enters inside. There, she plans to use the landline phone to call for outside help but the phone malfunctions. In the meantime, the owner of the apartment supermarket finds the switch to the main entrance in the control room. He excitedly tells everyone that they can soon open the roll-up door leading outside. Hearing the good news, everyone gathers near the main entrance. However, as the roll-up door slowly opens, they see a tall, monstrous creature standing nearby. Curious, they peek outside and a woman even takes a photo to post on her social media. By the time everyone reacts, it's too late as the monster opens its bloody mouth and a long tongue reaches out wrapping around a security guard. In the blink of an eye, he is sucked dry by the monster. Seeing this, some people quickly hide while others are paralyzed with fear and collapse to the ground. In the face of crisis, only Lee bravely steps forward to fight. He uses a fire extinguisher to force the monster back and tells the confused supermarket owner to cooperate with him. Once the monster is forced out of the apartment, they must immediately close the roll-up door. Just as they're about to succeed, the fire extinguisher stops working at the crucial moment. Suddenly, Sai Young appears, tackling the monster outside the main door. Fortunately, Lee quickly manages to pull her back into the building. After the crisis is resolved, Lee tells everyone that there are more than just one monster. In the fog, various monsters have gathered in the community outside who prey on human beings. In a flashback scene, it's revealed that Cha is a 19-year-old high schooler who refuses to go to school. He rejects all social activities and his only pastime is staying in his room playing games. His parents plan to take him and his sister on a trip, but Cha refuses to participate. On the way, his father argues with his mother about Che's condition. From their conversation, it can be heard that the father is mostly busy with work and rarely cares for the family. The argument distracts the father and tragedy strikes as the next moment their car crashes into a truck killing all three of them. At the family funeral, Cha finally makes an appearance. However, he is not sad but rather angry because his parents left him with very little money. He breaks down realizing that the money is not enough for him to survive as he originally intended to rely on his parents for life. Emotionally agitated, Cha is carried out of the funeral hall. Back to the present, Jisoo sits on the floor with Cha sleeping beside her. Wook, who called her over to take care of Cha, sneaks upstairs without informing anyone. In the meantime, the ballet girl, unaware of the situation outside, walks downstairs. Suddenly, she hears a noise nearby, accidentally sprains her ankle, and falls on the ground. Coincidentally, Wook passes by the spot, and the two share an awkward moment. Suddenly, Cha's neighbor who turned into a monster reappears and attacks Wook, biting his shoulder. However, he kicks the monster girl into a wall and repeatedly attacks until she stops moving. Elsewhere, Jisoo also prepares to go downstairs. Around the corner, she discovers a white-collared man holding a wine bottle mumbling to himself about being betrayed by his boss. As he becomes angrier, he mutates and starts roaring. Seeing this, Jisoo knocks him out with the baseball bat. However, the man turns into a monster, and just as Jisoo's life hangs in the balance, Jung, the Korean language teacher, appears and slices off half of the monster's head. They think the monster is dead, but he unexpectedly revives with half a head. 
it seems that the monsters cannot be killed. At the building's entrance, Lee asks everyone to move objects to block the door to prevent monsters from entering again. The woman from Gangnam says her daughter is still on her way back from school and asks Lee to block the door later. Considering everyone's safety, Lee rejects her request. At the same time, everyone receives an emergency text message from the government warning them to isolate anyone with symptoms such as nosebleeds, fainting, and aggression. Fear spreads and everyone is reluctant to leave, hoping for a rescue team to arrive. A curly-haired man believes that no one will come to save them. Since the garage is also sealed, they can't outrun the monsters without a car. He thinks they should return to their homes and urges people to open the stairwell door and climb the stairs with him. However, a soldier, who also lives in the apartment complex, stops him, pointing out that their priority is to block the entrance and observe the situation. The supermarket owner also steps in to prevent the curly-haired man from opening the door as nobody knows if there are monsters behind it. As they argue, the sound of a nearby door opening is suddenly heard. Everyone is frightened and retreats. Seeing Wook walk out of the door with his monster-inflicted wound, they treat him like a threat. The supermarket owner uses a stun gun to ambush and electrocute him. Eight hours later, Cha finally wakes up from his coma. Outside the window, it looks like a scene from an apocalyptic movie. Suddenly, he starts to bleed from his nose. Later, he and Lee go online at almost the same time and discover a post with pictures from an anonymous blogger. The post says that whatever is happening is not a disease but a curse on humanity. Before turning into monsters, people experience unexplained nosebleeds and hallucinations. The blogger who is hunted by monsters advises people to terminate themselves if they show symptoms. But if anyone is determined to survive, there's one thing they should bear in mind. However, just then the internet connection is lost leaving them without answers. Cha suddenly remembers the instant noodles he placed by the door and wonders if they are still there. However, he finds not only the noodles but also the half-headed monster that had its head sliced off earlier. Luckily, the monster can't see anything. Cha wants to pick up a stick on the ground for self-defense but any slight movement could attract the monster's attention. Cha doesn't dare to move, but soon the half-headed monster leaves on its own. On the ground floor, the supermarket owner and two timid residents go to the storage room where Wook is being held. Although they are unsure if he will turn into a monster, they decide to kill him and not take any unnecessary risks. The supermarket owner enters the room wearing a gas mask to do the job. As soon as he walks in, he is almost scared to death by the security guard's corpse. Unexpectedly, Wook pretends to be asleep and knocks out the owner with a headbutt. On the other hand, Jisoo and Jung team up to search for supplies. As they pass by Wook's room, they hear a voice from inside, uttering four numbers. Jisoo guesses it's a lock code and after entering it, the door indeed opens. The duct-taped man who had somehow moved to the door is saved by the two. It turns out that he is a photographer who is the real resident of this room. He claims to have been the victim of a home invasion from Wook. Jung recalls the green duct tape he saw when he first encountered Wook, which confirms this information. The photographer asks the pair what's happening outside as he could always hear noises from his room. Jisoo says it's hard to explain in a few words, but he'll find out soon. Following this, the three of them leave the room together with the photographer feeling insecure as he sees the other two armed. So he goes back to his room to grab a hammer for self-defense. Soon they find a homeowner who has hanged himself in one of the rooms. This reminds Jisoo of a friend who committed suicide and left her alone. Jung assumes the homeowner felt despair and chose to end his life. However, the photographer disagrees, stating the man has been dead for at least a week. Curious, Jung asks how he knows, but the photographer doesn't want to say anything more. Later, the photographer returns to his room alone, not wanting to cause trouble for the others. Elsewhere, Cha once again has the idea of ending himself while he is still human. As he opens the window and looks down, he sees a man from the 12th floor climbing down on a rope, trying to find some food for his two young children. The man is completely unaware of the monster nearby, watching him intently. Cha calls out to warn him, but unfortunately the man is attacked by the monster and falls off the building. Cha closes the window and hides in his room with the cries for help from the man's children echoing in his ears. He wants to help and decides to take a look downstairs. At the same time, the monster also notices him and wraps him tightly like a python capturing its prey. Just when Cha thinks he will be taken away, the monster's head is suddenly severed. The person who saved him is a man living on the same floor as Cha who had just used a homemade cannon to fend off the monster. Cha wants to speak but the man stops him as making noise will attract the monsters. They communicate by writing on paper and the man reminds Che not to speak while also telling him that these creatures won't die. Cha looks downstairs and sees that although the monster has lost its head, its remaining body can still move freely. The man asks Cha if he wants to save those kids and Cha decides to be a hero. Following the man's advice, 
he puts on headphones and keeps his phone connected to a call so that any approaching monsters will create noise as a warning. Cha successfully arrives at the man's room. It is revealed that the man is a veteran, proficient in assembling various weapons, but is disabled in both legs and can only sit in a wheelchair. This means that Cha will have to save the children himself. The veteran modifies the stick Cha brought into an electric baton with a blade, but it's not enough to kill the monsters and can only be used for self-defense. Cha asks for the veteran's homemade cannon, but he says he can't lend it because he only has three rounds of ammunition. Moreover, the veteran wants to save the last round for himself if he has to end his life personally. With no other choice, Cha takes the electric baton and leaves. In the meantime, the half-headed monster is still wandering around the building and Cha hides in a broken elevator to avoid it. However, soon the apartment loses power and Cha takes the opportunity to electrocute the monster before running away quickly. The monster follows the sound but cannot accurately locate Cha. Its GPS-like tentacles are still lethal. However, our hero takes advantage of the monster's keen hearing and deliberately throws two bouncing balls creating constant noise that confuses the monster. He then launches a surprise attack from behind, giving the monster an electric shock. In the end, the half-headed monster collapses to the ground unable to recover for a while. Meanwhile, Lee wants Sai Young to go to the control room in his place while he goes to the power distribution room to check on the power. He suspects that it's just a power outage in the building since there are still some lights on outside. However, Sai Young insists on going to the distribution room herself. Before leaving, she grabs some supplies from the supermarket, much to the distress of the supermarket owner. Lee hands her a walkie-talkie and urges her to be cautious. Sai Young prepares to enter the power distribution room, but a lady with a dog warns her not to go in. Her dog has been restless and agitated as if there's something inside the room. However, Sai Young bravely enters the room anyway. Meanwhile, Cha finally locates the two kids and is about to help them escape when he starts to bleed from his nose. Worried that he might lose control and hurt the children, he tells them to leave quickly. He then becomes trapped in a struggle with his dark self as images of being bullied at school flash through his mind. His dark side mocks him, saying that he's just a pathetic weakling, trying to act tough in front of others. Feeling frustrated, Cha is gradually swallowed up by his dark persona. Just as he is struggling with his inner demons, a monster appears nearby and flexes its muscles. The beast breaks down the door and debris falls on Che. The two children try to pull him out but are too physically weak to do so. As the muscular monster is about to grab the children, Che uses his last bit of rationale to cling onto the monster's feet. He then tells the children to run to room 1408 and find the paraplegic veteran. The children escape the danger but Che is left to be beaten by the monster. Fortunately, Ji Su and Jung, who heard the commotion, arrive in time to injure the monster and rescue him. Outside, the two children quickly climb to the 14th floor. The brother who has never seen such terrifying scenes is so scared that he wets his pants. On this floor, they encounter the half-headed monster. Quickly, the sister covers her brother's mouth, standing still not to make any noise. To their dismay, the muscular monster also begins to climb up to the 14th floor. Unexpectedly, the half-headed monster hears the movements and attacks it with its tentacles mistaking it for a prey. Taking advantage of the two monsters fighting, the siblings quickly climb up to the 15th floor. Meanwhile, the muscular monster pummels the half-headed monster and eventually throws it out of the window. The siblings knock on several doors on the 15th floor, but no one answers their plea. Just as the muscular monster approaches, the strange woman with the empty baby pram appears on the spot. She blocks the monster's path and pleads not to hurt the children. However, the beast kicks her away. Dazed by the attack, she sees her deceased child and recalls the accident that took her daughter's life. The woman tells the muscular monster that she has known all along that her child is gone. But the monster doesn't care and brutally beats her. Fortunately, Chai and Jung finally find their way to the children. Just as Cha tells the children to run quickly, the strange woman mutates and jumps onto the muscular monster's shoulders. She clings to the beast and prevents it from harming the children. Even as a monster, the woman has a strong maternal instinct. Taking advantage of the chaos, Jung slashes the muscular monster with a sword, causing it to throw the woman to the ground. The monster then faces off against Jung, who lures it step by step towards a nearby window. When the beast leaps forward, Jung sidesteps, causing it to shatter through the window and fall down the building. Following this, Ji Su, who has also arrived on the spot, approaches the mutated woman. Looking at her monstrous appearance, Ji Su wants to raise her baseball bat, but stops when the woman begins to ask about the whereabouts of the children. After a short while, the woman reverts back to normal human form. Cha then takes the children to room 1408, and Jai Su also brings the woman to the same room. 
She asks the woman to go into the room while she herself goes to find Jung. Soon afterwards, Jun and Ji Su return to the latter's home where they pack up necessary belongings. Eventually, they leave the room with a bass guitar and a bag of supplies and head to room 1408 to meet up with everyone else. On the other side, Sai Young arrives at the power distribution room and successfully resolves the building's electricity issue. Now, a news broadcast shows the South Korean president declaring a state of emergency and urging citizens not to go outside. However, the president suddenly mutates mid-speech, and the broadcast is interrupted as guards open fire on the president. Everyone is panicking, as it seems the government can't provide help during this crisis. At this point, Lee realizes his sister, the ballet girl, is not on the ground floor. She's in her room dealing with a sprained ankle. Meanwhile, Sai Young hasn't returned because she encountered a spider monster while leaving the power distribution room. The monster wraps her in webbing and leaves her hanging upside down from the room ceiling. On the ground floor, everyone wants to go into the supermarket to get food, but the supermarket owner locks the door from the inside, saying he's not running a charity and they need to pay for the food. Just as everyone is feeling helpless, the photographer appears with a box of snacks and starts distributing it to everyone. However, the dog lady notices blood stains on the box and her dog becomes restless and agitated, so she doesn't dare take food from the photographer. Meanwhile, Lee uses the community broadcast system to tell all survivors to bring food, medicine, and weapons to the first floor for safety. The Gangnam woman takes advantage of Lee's broadcast to secretly open the door. Her daughter has already run to the apartment entrance, but everyone still restrains the Gangnam woman, preventing her from taking any risks. Just then, the soldier rushes out to save the girl, only to be killed by the long-tongued monster, which also kills the girl with its tentacles. The horrifying scene stuns everyone who can only watch helplessly as the long-tongued monster feeds on the girl's body. While everyone is scared stiff, Lee tries to block the door with an iron cabinet. The next moment, the monster's tentacle pierces the iron cabinet, narrowly missing Lee. Disheartened, the Gangnam woman blames Lee for her daughter's death, thinking that if she had been allowed to go earlier, her daughter would still be alive. Upstairs, Jung and Jai Su plan to go to the ground floor to check the situation and bring the others, if it is safe. Cha steps forward, ready to join them. Worried for their safety, the veteran insists they take his homemade weapons for protection. On the ground floor, everyone is reinforcing the front door. The dog lady and the supermarket owner's wife chat about the Gangnam woman's loss, thinking she's pitiable. The dog lady also casually mentions Sai Young. It turns out her fiancé also lives in this building and they were supposed to get married soon. But for some unknown reason, her fiancé suddenly passed away before the wedding. Meanwhile, Sai Young manages to remove her coat, get free from the web of the spider monster, and quickly hide inside a ventilation duct. The creature relentlessly pursues her, but Sai Young relies on her astonishing physical strength to escape danger multiple times. As she prepares to jump out of the duct, the spider monster spits out a web, tightly wrapping it around her neck. He swings her like a pendulum, and in her panic, she desperately kicks a glass window, shattering it. She then grabs a piece of broken glass and successfully cuts the web, freeing herself. At that moment, her phone which had fallen to the ground suddenly rings. Si Young cannot reach the incoming call due to a metal fence. However, the display shows that it was her deceased fiancé calling. Since there was no signal in the apartment, it could be that she was simply hallucinating. Next, Si Young returns to the ground floor that night and punches Lee in the stomach upon seeing him. It turns out that before the mission, they had a conversation in the management room. During that time, Lee had discovered a monster in the power distribution room through the surveillance system, but did not inform her of the truth. The next morning, alarm sirens echo across the city, and the news reports that the country had entered a state of emergency, with the military overseeing security in the affected area. The military confirms that an unspecified majority of citizens had transformed into unidentified creatures, with the exact cause still unknown. Respiratory and blood contact were not infection routes, but anyone experiencing hallucinations, hearing voices, having a drop in body temperature, nosebleeds, or fainting should be isolated. The unidentified creatures have a powerful ability to recover and regenerate, so they must be dealt with before they fully evolve. 